I thought we'd just talk a little bit more about what service we're coming from and the population that we work within and how we're using our population to really think more about how we tailor our thinking to be more male focused. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, basically, um, specialist forensic psychologist is, is, a, is a quite fancy term. We're, we're very ordinary psychologists, actually. And I think one of the um, things that's quite important to think about is across the conference so far and across the years to date, um, we've been trying as frontline clinicians to get greater traction and interest in this topic. And as psychologists who aren't necessarily in the most influential position in organizations, it's quite difficult to do that. So um, pulling people in, motivating people, getting people interested, but more importantly, getting the service users interested and getting their voice to be collaboratively um, paired with yours has been really, really important. So um, as it says there, um, from psychologists, we've moved out a lot wider. So there's um, every single part of a multidisciplinary team represented in part of our work. So we've got obviously psychiatrists, speech and language, occupational therapists, um, as well as a variety of different psychologists, counseling, forensic, clinical. And after a while, um, you, you always have to justify the hours you put into anything because um, the conversations so far in the conference haven't really said that some of the pressures that stop us thinking about men's issues mm. are actually about demand and capacity. And if you have an overwhelming amount of referrals coming in, and there may be a diagnostically driven service, then actually thinking of somebody in front of you as something other than somebody with a personality disorder mm. or somebody other than having anxiety and depression takes that extra strength of leap uh, clinically to really consider um, when the demand might um, overwhelm. So um, trying to get the services to think about a commitment and a strategy to move mm. it forward has been uh, part of the battle, but actually part of the pleasure. And as we've worked forward, you'll, you'll hear a little bit more as we talk about um, how service users and staff have actually combined to develop a conversation across a trust. Now, having a conversation across a trust is very, very hard. <laughs> but um, by randomly selecting people who are arguably in power within a trust, who people uh, may not have a clinical background, who may be in charge of finance and things like that, we have been able to... Um, get a strategy going, basically a commitment across mm -hmm. a trust where clinicians are allowed to have a few hours out of practice to really push this forward. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, really. Okay. So I suppose, actually you've spoken a little bit about this, this strategy that we've, we've sort, sort of thought of, we call the male gender strategy, um, or, and, and we work within an NHS setting. And we've attracted quite a bit of interest because this isn't common. It's not common to sort of focus on gender within the NHS because actually the NHS sometimes, although we have male services, female services, mixed services, we're actually quite gender blind. So we are trying to do more of this. So the interest that we kind of get is why a male strategy? What, why aren't we thinking more about women? Well, actually, we are thinking about women and there's a lot of thought about women. There's not a lot of thought about men. Um, we think about uh, our colleagues who are saying, oh, actually, that's actually really, really novel, and something like this might be really helpful, so thank you for doing that. So we're getting quite a lot of praise from our colleagues. Um, we're getting um, a lot of ideas about, but if we're only looking at it through gender, aren't we going to miss everything else? Well, yes, but if we don't look at it through gender at all, well, we might not ever see it through that lens. So we're trying to get a bit of a view in that way. Uh, one of the other areas we're thinking about is how can acknowledging maleness um, and being a man think about serious issues. So we've heard a lot about, over the course of the conference, about male suicide and how men may act in serious ways to end their life before they talk. So how can we bring in these ideas before we get to those points? Um, and also this idea of, but are all men different? Can you really think about things based on gender? Well, yes, we acknowledge that and we'll talk about that, but it's that idea of we've got to start somewhere. So it's thinking, we're trying to just raise with you guys today about our inroads and where we're at at the minute, okay? Um, we've been recognised quite well and we just wanted to blow our own horn a bit and just sort of say that it's gone quite well. So um, locally in the West Midlands, where we come from, we're, a, we're the Birmingham Trust, uh, we have gone to quite a few uh, areas where we've been nominated for awards um, for for thinking more about maleness. So this is something which we actually never really expected, actually. As soon as we started planning, playing with this uh, idea, people caught wind of it and they thought, wow, 
it's, it's a bit abstract, it's a bit something different, let's put it, let's put it um, up into the general fora. So if you want to know a bit more, we can talk about, about how things have kind of come about for us. Um, and as I said, as we, as we talk today, we really recognise that when you talk about male gender, male gender is on a continua, as is sort of sex, sexuality, and attractive, uh, who you're attracted to. So we're, we're really, really in that recognition. And sometimes when I talk today, we might ha be at risk of stereotyping a little bit, but sometimes that's necessary to think about the cultural context in which men exist in. <coughs> okay. So, I, I mentioned briefly that idea of gender blindness in forensic settings. Now, Ashley and I work in a male setting, and many of the staff who work there are female. Um, we mentioned again about sort of the number of female psychologists, the number of ma uh, female therapists. There are a lot of male staff, um, but sometimes they're in security positions, or sometimes they're in nursing positions where actually their contact with uh, our service users is very different or is much more formalised and it's thinking about um, how we sometimes forget about the key fact that the guys we're working with are guys, they're men. Um, and then we think about sort of how those male characteristics, being a man in a male service, can actually impact in terms of different areas of development, how people will have developed thoughts, beliefs, ways of behaving that may interfere or impact with how they then react once they're in a really frightening, scary, uh, status-driven service where they're trying to, trying to get out, really. So, I mean, the, the picture sort of, uh, if you've been to conferences before, we've kind of shown this before, but the idea that the key experiences are um, what we'll all go through, but then we might think about the, the men that we see in our secure forensic services Many of them have, due to, as we heard about in the conference talks yesterday and some today, may have experienced some form of trauma, some form of abuse, some sort of form of difference in their upbringing. And at that point, we see uh, some of the attempt to cope with, with modern life and uh, demand coming out in ways which are sort of hyper-masculine and it can be quite tricky. And then we think about why, why men, when they come into a secure forensic service or a prison service, why they don't talk to us. Well, it takes a long time to, to sort of get guys to get engaged with us. And it's that idea of uh, we're a very power-driven service. We're a service where they are with us under duress. We're, we're there, they're there and they don't want to be there. Um, there's a lot of humilia humiliation and this sense of inadequacy. There's this sense that I think someone mentioned earlier that the, the mere act of opening up can really cause um, this fear of if I say why I've behaved in a certain way or if I say what's happening I'm just going to end up being here longer I'm going to give them more ammunition I'm going to cause myself even more problems and this idea of we're bombarding them with psychobabble so are, are we doing ourselves any favours in getting men to work with us and then we see things that are seen in both men and women, but these idea of therapy interfering behaviours, and it's trying to understand how we can overcome those a little. Okay, so how do we work in a forensic service? So this is, I suppose, applying some of the, the theory and the thought that we've had over the last while in the, in the conference about uh, to sort of clinical practice. So we have what we call a care pathway, and uh, a man will be admitted to our service following a referral from prison or the community. And then what will happen is um, the average length of stay in our service is about two years, which means that somebody may be with us as short as six months, but we have people who are with us for, for eight <coughs> years or longer, which is quite, quite a, a stark idea of somebody being removed from their, from their life for that long. Um, but people, somebody comes with us and we either have loads of information or we have not much at all. So we really need that person to tell us what's happened to them, tell us what's led them to behave in a way that's caused them to get in trouble with the criminal justice system, tell us what's happened in terms of their upbringing, their early experiences, their life that has led them to experience difficulties. And then we think a bit more about them. We think, what's happened? Why has it happened? How are we going to help the situation improve? 
And how are we going to understand why that behavior keeps going? What maintains it? And how do we, most importantly, stop it happening again? How do we help that person in their future? And let me do some of these uh, procedural things like develop a care plan, develop risk assessments, develop uh, support, recommend therapies. And these are sort of things that you'll see in our, in our sort of NHS system and care system of how we support people. So that's just a bit of context so you can kind of understand where we were coming from because we were saying we need to think differently because some of the people we are trying to support are not thriving, they're not recovering, they're not, they're not moving through the service very easily and why is that? So um, we, we did have lots of these clips, but we've, we've narrowed it down just to one because, we, um, because of time really. Big and strong, and men have more of them. Um, yeah, the trailers have them, they to be stronger than a female, and they think of dinner and sharing what's in their head is a weakness, and they're exposing themselves to make themselves feel vulnerable. Yeah. So that was um, a service user who's had quite a bit of psychological input, so he feels quite comfortable articulating that, but essentially. Um, he, he was chosen out of several video clips to be the best representation of why men in services um, struggle to speak. Mm. But, but again, we've been getting more sort of clips and people able to sort of talk about how um, they can recognise their experience of being a man interfering with their ability to access and, and cope or really benefit from support. So this is what we wanted to talk to you about. We wanted to talk about this idea of formulation and we're going to explain to people what formulation is. Some people might be really familiar, some people it might be a new idea, um, but essentially formulation is about organising the information that we have and understanding it and trying to help us then support the people that we work with. So as I said, it's an explanation or a hypothesis about what's happening, about how an individual comes to present with a certain the term is in the, in the sort of thing is disorder or a circumstance in a particular point of time. Okay, so um, one of the things we just wanted to sort of put out to the audience is when you think about men's difficulties, how often do you think about the fact that a person is male or a man? And I wonder if actually it's less obvious than you think because we were sort of thinking this, about this to ourselves and thinking about um, we work with a person as a person first and then we think about all the diversities that this person comes with but actually sometimes we really ignore the gender of the person and what that might mean for them and it's trying to bring that back, back into consciousness. Okay. So what could a gendered formulation be? So we know that gendered formulation is rare. Actually, we haven't seen very much evidence that it happens at all, or there are a few models that are out there to think about male distress. We'll talk about them in a second. And it's that idea of how many services or how many people are actually using these in clinical practice to really inform what they do. So it's that idea of, for any of you leaving today, if you were just to think a little bit more from a male perspective when you're thinking about male distress or male uh, experiences, that would be something, a really good step in, in the right direction. Um, and thinking this, this idea of going from generic to problem-specific to gender-specific formulation, can that be a possibility? So, um, Roger Kingley, sitting in the audience, um, this is his model of um, male distress. And we were sort of thinking about this, about um, how can we use some of this idea to um, inform us about some of the experiences that men may have and how might we think some of the men in our services is this something that's really alive for them and how do we think more about supporting men in those ways so um, again a number of studies we sort of have consulted the literature thinking about can we pull out some of the key ideas so that idea of men fearing being competent there being different schemas, these underlying ideas of what it is to be male, these ideas of cognitive being very much up, up in, our, in our minds versus really connecting with emotion. 
And then these ideas of, are there any things that men tell themselves that get in the way of them engaging in treatment or therapy? So, again, more than one way to formulate. We've only got a few minutes, so we're only going to tell you about one way that we've thought. Um, and if you're interested, have a look up more. Um, we are going to talk you through very quickly one way of formulating. So we talk a lot about violence in our service because we're a forensic service. But it's that idea of a generic formulation might be really sort of explaining what you're seeing, talking about it in a very literal sense. But applying a male lens, you might be thinking about how is masculinity or male beliefs, how is that allowing you to interpret in a slightly different way? How might you think about male self-esteem? How might you think about the cultural appropriation of um, a male response to being ashamed or intimidated? How might you think about maintenance cycles? So we sort of try and think about this in our risk assessment and when we're applying things, or when we're speaking with men about maybe what's happened. And very briefly, um, we, we have applied sort of the male lens to a number of formulations. We've done it to CBT, we've done it to um, systemic formulation, but we're only going to present one, which is kind of a, a very common approach, which is called the 5P formulation. And this is the idea of what's a, what's a problem, what's predisposing factors, and, and so on. Um, this is almost a, a, an approach that was first used in um, working with challenging behaviours in autis autism services, and this is kind of um, <coughs> one of the ways. And we're just going to talk through what we've been doing in our service. Sorry, that's going to come up again. Um, so we've sort of thought a little bit about, in a presenting problem, if you're seeing maybe an aggressive style or an attempt to elicit care or substances or something, how do you then think about, using this male lens, what that might be about? And again, we might be barking up the wrong tree. It might not be about male gender at all. It might be about something completely different. But it at least gives us a hypothesis or an angle to be thinking about, to test out, to see whether or not it's something about shame avoidance or about visibly aggressive behaviour being um, something that is inherently a male action. And is it that's the learnt way of doing things? And then we kind of have gone through thinking, predisposing, what has led this person to do that? Have they learnt scripture throughout their lifetime? Are there any beliefs around how they might defend their esteem or their person? What's going on? And sort of we've gone through and um, carried that on and really had to think about sort of how that might work, what situations might trigger difficulties and how might those be thought through in a male sense. And again, we're only showing this very briefly to sort of say that this is something that you could be doing in, in your service or your settings to think about how do we almost put on our male tinted glasses and say, we're going to look a bit more in this way. Okay? So, um, what next? So, the NHS at the moment across England is, is, and England, Scotland, and Wales are thinking about this idea of healthcare improvement. Um, we've recently put in a bid to spend more time thinking about different issues through this male lens. And um, one of the areas that we're going to be hopefully looking at is serious incidents in forensic healthcare in terms of um, male suicide in inpatient care, male suicide in prison, and so on. And how do we understand this in terms of maleness? Um, I was just going to ask, yep. Kerry, that's quite a, um, a novel move because mm. a lot of quality improvement looks at outcomes, and a typical quality improvement project might say, how in nine months can you reduce a waiting yes. list from this size to that size? So they have quite a quantitative focus. The idea that um, this is obviously far, far away from a, a, a quantitative, neat little project, the idea that they're exercising some flexibility, they're encouraging service mm. users to be involved in building it, um, as well as staff, is, is really quite encouraging. So there's three cohorts of um, psychologists and other people who are going to be uh, presenting projects um, under the quality improvement umbrella mm -hmm. based on a male gender sort of uh, subject. And so, like Kerry alluded to there, um, we, we know that in um, prison settings and uh, forensic mental health settings or general acute settings, men represented higher mm. in serious incidents such as aggression, suicide. We're talking sort of in the 70% figure. Um, also in, in other areas of um, staff and workforce difficulties. So in HR, 
uh, disciplinary measures and responses to challenges at work are poorly accepted by men. And there's a greater um, level of tension with the employer and the employee, but also men don't seek help and won't accept the help if it's offered by an employer. So some of the themes across mm -hmm. the conference, uh, conference have come in. So essentially, while some of our conversation has been clinical, uh, it's actually also about how do workforces work better, thinking about the male members uh, within the workforce. Um, because as we've talked about across the last few mm. days, if the environment isn't conducive to thinking about men. We can't just be focusing on a few men who happen to be sectioned. And when I say a few men, I mean thousands um, across the system. Yeah. So there's that. And then we're thinking about product. So um, what can we offer our colleagues that will help them in their day-to-day -day work? So can we offer them uh, formulation diagrams that are already male sensitive or ask those questions? Um, we thought about can we almost do longitudinal formulations, which some of you might be sort of familiar with, that have almost a CBT slant or a certain slant that we've already filled in the boxes and we've sort of thought about those if-then statements. So that idea of like, if I am weak, then people will take advantage of me. If I am um, emotional, then people will think I'm more feminine. Um, the, the, the sort of ideas of how can we sort of just allow these resources to be available so that at least it can give um, people chances to, to sort of see through this, this male perspective which may be otherwise overlooked. Um, and, yeah. Um, so, in summary, existing formulations that are used across the NHS and, and also in private practice and by... Uh, various people, professionals, are really helpful, but they can be enhanced. And we were thinking about how adding a male perspective is actually quite rare, it's quite novel. So people who are doing this and who will do this um, ongoing will be taking almost a bit of a bold step, and we hope that that's something that people will do more of, and that a male lens can really enhance clinicians' practice and service users' understanding of their experience. And I'd be really interested to think a bit more about maybe people's reactions or thoughts about what they've heard today, because this is something that we're still developing and coming to <laughs> kind of bring into fruition ourselves. Okay, thank, thank you. you